Welcome again to today's lecture on contaminant hydrogeology. My name is Thomas Boving from the University of Rhode Island. I'm currently a Fulbright Scholar at IIT Roki. Um, today I will be talking about enhanced aquifer flashing technologies. And by that we will take, uh, we make use of the information we learned during the previous lectures on solubilization theory. So, if you recall, during the discussion of solubilization theory, we talked about ways how we can enhance the solution of hydrophobic contaminants that are otherwise not very soluble. And we singled out surfactants, for example, as means of increasing the solubility of hydrophobic contaminants. And in addition to increasing solubility, surfactants can also be used to form emulsions that mobilize organic contaminants by increasing, uh, sorry, by reducing the interfacial tension between two phases that do not mix, a non-aqueous phase liquid on the one hand, like oil, and the aqueous phase, which is water. So emulsions is one way to mobilize organic contaminants. A th second way, or a second approach we discussed is uh, using the co-solvency effect. By this I mean uh, using co-solvents like ethanol or isopropyl alcohol to modify the properties of the aqueous phase so that becomes more suitable to dissolve hydrophobic contaminants. And that's the co-solvency effect which we can also put to good use in remediation engineering. And then third, I introduced you to macromolecules like, surfact uh, sorry, like cyclodextrin as shown here. These are large, non-toxic sugar molecules that have a hydrophobic interior and a hydrophilic exterior. The hydrophilic exterior makes it very soluble in water, the cyclodextrin molecule, very soluble. The hydrophobic cavity permits other hydrophobic compounds like PC or TC or oil to partition into the cavity. And that is the trick of cyclodextrin to facilitate higher solubilities of otherwise very difficult to dissolve compounds. And this process is complexation, the complexation of hydrophobic contaminants. That's the third approach we're going to talk about today when we uh, discuss various technologies that make use of um, the solub solubilization um, processes that I introduced you to earlier. So why do we care about the solubilization theory? That's what we're going to talk, uh, talk about first. Then we talk about enhanced solubilization, enhanced mobilization, and then I introduce you to uh, flushing or technologies that are used to flushing in situ aquifers that are contaminated. All right. So what does solubilization theory have to do with site remediation? It's basically all about modification, alteration or changes in the groundwater's physical chemical properties to enhance the removal of contaminants from the subsurface. So if we can make water, the groundwater, a more suitable soil, uh, solvent for hydrophobic compounds and in the process increase their solubility, increase their mobility, we get to the point where we can flush out these contaminants that would adhere to the soil. We make them partitioning into the flushing solution. And in case of non-aqueous phase liquids, we can actually get those napples mobilized from the pore space where they may be trapped, where they may be sitting immobile, residual, and, and, and get them out of there. So with solubility enhancement, I mean the removal of little soluble hydrophobic contaminants from the contaminated aquifer by artificially enhancing the solubility of hydrophobic contaminants. Solubility enhancement can be achieved with surfactants, co-solvents, cyclodextrins. All three enhance the solubility of uh, contaminants. So these agents uh, work because they, the underlying uh, processes are related to formation of micelles in case of surfactants. In case of cyclodextrin, we're talking macromolecules into which these hydrophobic contaminants can partition into. So what that means is hydrophobic compounds partition out of the water into 
the uh, either micelle or cyclodextrin molecule. With co-solvents, the solubility is enhanced by uh, changing the water phase properties to be more suitable for dissolving hydrophobic contaminants. And that's done by adding a co-solvent like ethanol or uh, isopropyl alcohol, as we have discussed earlier. Bottom line is, due to t these agents and these processes, we're creating a, a condition where the solubility of the hydrophobic contaminants is dramatically enhanced, sometimes orders of magnitude. So that's one way, enhancing the solubility. A second approach is to enhance the mobility of contaminants. And here I'm talking about contaminants that are present at very high concentrations as residuals, residual napples trapped in the pore space. Example, you're on a gas station, you start digging, you're finding the soil is heavily discolored with what smells like oil, gasoline, diesel. Very typical situation on a gas station. Here, if you take a microscope and look into the pore space, you will find small droplets of gasoline or diesel trapped in those pores. It's a very nasty situation. Very little you can do about it unless you increase the mobility of these tiny droplets and make them uh, move out of the pore space to where you can actually capture them. And this is also done in remediation technology. Here we change again the physical chemical properties of the residual, in this case the napple, so that it can be entering the mobile water phase. This is done through decreases in the interfacial tension between the aqueous phase and the non-aqueous phase. By decreasing the interfacial tension, we allow for the napple to become emulsified in the aqueous phase in the groundwater. So, which of these agents uh, do that? That's surfactants primarily, but also co-solvents. So these two compounds reduce, lower the interfacial tension. Therefore, they're being used as agents to induce mobilization. Cyclodextrin, or a third compound, does not do that. It doesn't dramatically reduce the interfacial tension. That's a big difference between surfactant and co-solvent. And cyclodextrin, on the other hand, is that uh, the difference is in the effect on the interfacial tension, which cyclodextrins have pretty much none. Okay, so by lowering the interfacial tension between the aqueous and the napple phase results in the emulsification of the organic pollutants. The uh, emulsified pollutants then can leave the soil pores and become mobile and become or being then transported in the water phase, meaning the moving groundwater. If you take a look at these two slides up here, you can clearly see on the left a sample of heavily contaminated, oil contaminated sand. Blackened, very typical. I've seen this many times excavating underground storage tanks that have leaked. You see these black discolored soils. Clear giveaway that you're dealing with the present of napple trapped in the pore space. Now, if I mix this system with surfactant solution, I'm ending up with soil that's no longer black. In fact, it looks pretty clean. And instead I have the, uh, you have to look carefully here, I have an emulsion of what is oil in surfactant solution. So this solution I can now get rid of. Away from the sand, leave the clean sand behind. That's the effect of enhanced mobilization using surfactants or alcohols. So maybe I should add co-solvent here. All right. So now we understand uh, how it works, um, mobilization, solubilization. Let's talk about the technologies that are based on these uh, techniques or uh, on these processes. The first one I want to introduce you to is SERR, which stands for surfactant, <coughs> excuse me, surfactant enhanced aquifer remediation. So surfactants and remediation increase both the mobilization and solubilization. We said that many times now. And these are the exact uh, properties which are exploited in remediation engineering. So we enhance solubilization and mobilization. In other words, we can speed up the removal of hydrophobic organic contaminants from the subsurface. 
And if we can speed up the removal, it means we reduce the remediation time and most important, the cost of site cleanup. In other words, if we increase the solubility, mobility, orders of magnitude, we can expect the time it takes to flush out these contaminants reduced by that much, by orders of magnitude. Now, how is it done? It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can consider surfing enhanced aquifer remediation a chemical enhancement to pump and treat. I assume everybody is familiar with pump and treat. It's uh, the oldest technology on the block. It's been used for many years. It basically is uh, pumping out water, flushing out the solution to the surface, treating it at the surface and re-injecting that uh, treated water back into the surface. Just relying on water is not very effective. As we know, hydrophobic contaminants don't want to dissolve in water, so you have to pump and pump and treat and treat and treat for decades or longer to achieve anything like a cleanup. Now, if we can chemically enhance such a system with surfactants, then we make the system much more effective. And that's exactly the application scheme of surfactant-enhanced aquifer remediation. So it starts with a surfactant solution at the surface, premixed surfactants in water, clean water of course, injected into a well, here's the well screen, that solution is then entering the polluted source zone, the polluted aquifer, the contamination sitting right here, and while moving, flowing, advective flow through the contaminated zone, the surfactant interacts with the contaminant, increases its solubilization, its solubility, and increases its mobility. And that is what's coming out of here is basically a highly concentrated mix of surfactant water and pollutant and that's being captured by an extraction well pumped to the surface where the uh, organic waste compounds are being separated we're not going to talk about how that's done but bottom line is we ending up with a uh, recovered surfactant solution waste goes this way now our recycled solution is going back into the ground so basically a continuous circle of flushing one pore volume after another after another with the idea to speed up the uh, remediation time relative to what a pump and treat a regular conventional pump and treat system would do now if we zoom in um, you see these different processes we have talked about at work um, the solubilization part here is at the leading edge of the injected plume again here's where the surfactant is being injected here it's where it's extracted, the solution that has flushed through the aquifer in this direction, this is the groundwater flow direction. And so the injected surfactant concentration begins to solubilize um, our contaminants by forming micelles. Recall micelles form above the critical micelle concentration, thereby increasing the solubility of the contaminants that were previously residing trapped in the pore space or adhering to the surface of the aquifer sediments they are being solubilized in this part of in the in the more uh, on the right side on the left side sorry the surfactant does its other uh, uh, trick it basically increases uh, sorry decreases the interfacial tension between the napple this red stuff here is napple the non-aqueous face liquid and emulsifies it. So here you can see an emulsion forming emulsion again a tiny droplets suspended in the aqueous phase and this is what we call mobilization. So what we get is a plume of highly concentrated solubilized um, contaminant and a plume of highly mobilized emulsified contaminants. So if we can make this plume now move towards our extraction well, what we're producing is a very highly concentrated solution of emulsified and solubilized contaminant. And that's very effective, very effective. As this slide here demonstrates, we basically have oil sitting here on the top, water on the bottom, and in between we have what is called our uh, an apple water emulsion. So you can imagine the concentration of oil in the water is so high that 
it is uh, ma orders of magnitudes higher than what you can do with just water. And by doing this in situ means in the ground, we are able to flush out contaminants rather quickly. And this is uh, just a basic uh, SEER technology component scheme. I'm not going into too much detail, but it has all the elements that I introduced to before. Injection wells, extraction wells, uh, mixing tanks, additional additions may be necessary, the extraction treatment separation system, and maybe SCADA to uh, uh, electronically uh, check the process. All right. In general, the surfactant solution being injected into the ground consists of water and some fraction of surfactants. Surfactant concentration typically range around 1 to 5 percent, depending on the type of contamination, the type of surfactants. And then also additives. Additives may be electrolytes, sorry, electrolytes and uh, co-solvents. These are being added to manipulate the density of the surfactant solution and also it, its potency in terms of uh, mobilization. And lastly, anti-foaming agents. Anybody who has ever used soap knows that soap will foam and foam is not something we really want in our treatment system. So to minimize, reduce uh, foaming from happening, there are anti-foaming agents that are being added to this solution. One word of caution, when you start mobilizing napples, in particular those napples that are more dense than water, or short denapples, you're creating a density effect and the mobilized denapple can sink deeper into the aquifer. That's indicated by this arrow here. This horizontal arrow is the uh, directional mobilization we want, but if the flow of the mobil mobilized napple is down and deep into the aquifer, then this can become a problem unless we are able to control the downward motion. If the downward mobilization cannot be controlled, then this technology, the surfactant enhanced aquifer remediation technology, should probably not be used because you can make a situation much worse by uncontrolling, by not being able to control the emulsion and possibly it escaping um, your treatment process not what you want. So if this is an issue, you shouldn't consider uh, this type of remediation technology. A list of few case studies. Again, I won't go over them in detail. There are many more since this table was produced, but there's a lot of information about this technology out there and different types of ge geological environment, different types of compounds, different types of surfactants. All that information is included in this table. There's a fairly recent publication, 2020, which reviews surfactant enhanced aquifer remediation, talks about mechanism influence, limitations, and also uh, problems. So if uh, you like to go into more detail, there's plenty of information, also a number of textbooks available. Second technology that builds on the co-solvency effect is called co-solvent flushing of polluted aquifers. Without repeating myself too much, the co-solvents are intended to enhance the mo mobility and solubility of hydrophobic contaminants in the subsurface. So similar to surfactants, they uh, have increased mobility solubility properties. Again, this is an in situ, in the ground remediation technology. And the goal is the same as before, reduce time and cost of site cleanup. And the application of co-solvents is very similar to that of uh, surfactants. Again, you have uh, uh, injection wells where a mix of co-solvent and clean water is being injected. The flow is uh, forced through the contaminated soil where the co-solvency effect takes place. And the resulting concentrate of mobilized, solubilized contaminant is extracted using one or more extraction wells which pump the solution to the surface where like before surfactants, cosolvents, same thing, the flushing solution is being treated, the contaminants are separated and if possible the cosolvent is recycled. So um, technically speaking very similar to surfactant enhanced flushing except here we're talking cosolvents. In a case study at the uh, uh, a Hill Air Force Base in Utah, conducted in 1994, a long time ago, 
a solution of 70% ethanol, 12% n-pentanol, a higher molecular weight uh, alcohol, and the remainder of water was injected into a cell that was used to test this technology. Inside that cell was a soil contaminated with NAPL, um, a compound mostly consisting of hydrocarbons, petroleum hydrocarbons. And this is what happened. So after the second, second point, second day of injection, the concentrations beginning to rise, the solubility of the uh, NAPL begins to increase, indicated by these colors ranging from blue, these are lower concentrations, to yellow to reds. After three days, almost the entire cell is now flooded with um, so fact, uh, sorry, a co solvent solution. And after four days, five days, we're beginning to extract that solution. So in other words, injection of the co-solvent extraction over about nine day period. Fairly quick, right? Nine day period. And what was observed, the results show that the NAPL mass removal was very high, 95, 99% in just nine days. Maybe a little bit less effective at the lower part of the unit meaning the bottom part, there's uh, some uh, remnants of NAPL present, but that may have been simply due to the difficulties to uh, control the flow field so that these lower parts of the aquifers could be effectively flushed. Bottom line, uh, it took nine days to remove the bulk of the NAPL with uh, just co-solvency flushing. Now, a co-solvent solution typically consists of water, and a co-solvent. And co-solvent concentration can range from 40 to 100%. 100% would be 100% ethanol or 100% isopropyl alcohol, depending on the site and uh, the, the, the speed by which a site needs to be cleaned up, you can increase the co-solvency effect by increasing the concentration of the co-solvent. So what you get is an increase in solubility, which increases the dissolution rate, it's also an effect by reducing sorption of uh, napples and other non-polar compounds from the soil in, in partitioning into the solution. And the de <coughs> a decrease in interfacial tension leads to uh, formation of emulsions and speeding up of napal uh, cleanup. Disadvantage um, relative to surfactants, there are fewer co-solvents that can be uh, selected from the list of surfactants is in the hundreds, maybe even higher. Co-solvents will be limited maybe to a dozen. Um, and again, like in surfactant hands flushing, when you deal with mobilized denapples, then there's always the uh, uh, concern about these mobilized denapples escaping your capture system, your extraction system, and uh, contaminating deeper parts of the aquifer, which is highly undesirable. Moving on, the third technology I want to introduce it to is cyclodextrin enhanced flushing or CDEF. Cyclodextrin uh, macromolecules enhance the solubility of hydrophobic contaminants, as we have discussed, but they do not mobilize them. That means cyclodextrin solution do not lower the interfacial tension uh, significantly. There's a little reduction, but it is not nearly as uh, important than compared to cosolvents and surfactants. So that's the big difference. And it's, again, an in situ remediation technology done in ground with the same reasons or the same goals as before, reduced time and cost of site cleanup. You have seen this picture for cosolvents and similar picture for surfactant flushing. Not much difference here. We're injecting instead of a coson or a surfactant solution, cyclodextrin solution. The idea is exactly the same. Injecting the flushing solution, flush out the contaminants from the contaminated zone, extract the uh, concentra concentrated solution to the surface, treat, get the contaminants out of the system, recycle what's possible, and re-inject back in. So very simple process, the same for all these three technologies, and this includes cyclodextrin. Now, why cyclodextrin? Um, it's a cheap, non-toxic sugar. It can be, it's produced at industrial scale. It's fairly easily to be made. It's uh, non-toxic. That's also another selling point. 
Um, being a sugar, it does not persist in the environment, like many surfactants or some types of alcohol that take long time to break down. Cyclodextrin can be broken down rather quickly, but not too quickly to lose its effectiveness during the actual treatment process, but within a couple of weeks or months. And because cyclodextrin doesn't increase the, mo uh, the uh, it doesn't reduce the interfacial tension, its properties, the fluid properties, basically are similar to that of water. So we, we don't have to worry about mobilization and uh, be worried about denapple escaping into lower parts of the aquifer. I'll show you a few pictures from a, a case study that I conducted a few years back on the Naval Amphibious Landing Base in Little Creek, Virginia, where we tested uh, the cleanup using cyclodextrin solution. And Without going into too much detail, what you're seeing here are a number of wells that have been drilled for this um, case study. Some of these wells are injection wells, like here in the center, we injected cyclodexin solution into the ground. And these are extraction wells, where we extracted cyclodexin solution after it flushed through the subsurface. So below where these uh, students of mine are standing is the contaminated source zone and we have uh, surrounded that source zone with extraction wells and this in the center in kind of like a star formation is the injection well. In the background you see large storage tanks here and here they contain our cyclodextrin solution the fresh solution so this is the solution going in and here's the solution stored that's coming out of the ground and so what we have is basically a closed loop goes in and comes out. Now the, the treatment of the solution coming out is happening in this part here. This is an air stripper where the solution coming out of the ground is being bubbled through with lots of air to remove any volatile organic contaminants. And the contaminant at this side in particular was TC and PC, which is very volatile. And then these contaminants are flushed out. The clean solution is going to be stored here and the uh, flushed out contaminants are being absorbed on activated carbon over here. So that's the general setup of the system. Here's another bird's eye view. Here's our air stripper where we remove the, co the contaminants, the activated carbon filters where we uh, catch the contaminants. And here's our sample unit where we can uh, sample each of these wells, extraction wells, separately so we can generate scientific data. One of my former students at work sampling, this was a 24-7 operation going on for several months. Um, a close-up of the injection well where the solution entering through this pipe and being injected into the ground and then dispersing from there on to the extraction wells. Again, my students, my student with the big storage tanks for cyclodextrin in the background. We had a, a GC, a gas chromatograph on the side to immediately uh, determine the concentration of the contaminants that we are flushing out of the ground. And that helped us to uh, judge how effective our process was. And in this graph, I'm showing you some of the results. Um, here is the concentration of the injected cyclodextrin solution. We injected a slug, meaning a one pulse, and then we observed what happens to the solution coming out of the, uh, out of the flow field. And you can see initially the uh, TCE concentration was fairly low, and then it dramatically increased to uh, five times the initial concentration. And then as the cyclodextrin concentration began to dissipate, the solubility of the uh, TC also went back down again. So it clearly demonstrates what happens when we inject cyclodextrin concentrations of the solution coming out of the ground increase, when the cyclodextrin concentration decreases, so do the uh, contaminant concentrations. So now the trick is to continue this process for some time until the source zone concentration has been depleted to the point that uh, additional injections of cyclodextrin make no longer sense. At that point, you can consider the source zone uh, being removed 
and whatever is left in the ground has to be taken care of by other types of remediation measures. If you're further interested in comparing the effectiveness of cyclodextrin to that of co-solvents, to that of uh, uh, surfactants, I would like to refer you to a paper that was part of my PhD thesis many years ago. It can be found in the Journal of Contaminant Hydrology. Okay, so let's sum it up here. The key points are that surfactant enhanced aquifer flushing, cyclodextrin enhanced flushing and co-solvent treatments are all in situ aquifer flushing technologies. They target the source zone, the most polluted zone, where you may find very high concentrations of hydrophobic compounds, including non-aqueous phase liquids like napples. This is where you want to uh, target these technologies at. The common goal of all, all three technologies is to reduce the time and the cost of the site remediation process make it make the remediation times much shorter from many decades, many years to months, weeks. That's the goal. However, you have to uh, work in teams of chemists and hydrologists, geologists to really take advantage of this technology because while they are very efficient, they certainly have some disadvantages like mobilization of uh, napples with surfactants and co-solvents. So it's very important that one knows about the advantages, but also about the disadvantages of these technologies. But overall, very powerful, very promising technologies. And an example how we can use theory um, and use that to our advantage by applying it to technologies for remediation in the field. And with that, I'd like to thank you and again, uh, hope to see you again in another lecture. Thank you so much.